Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so we are pleased to have Eric today. Um, Eric uh, got his PhD degree from UC Berkeley, and he's a associate professor at Ohio University, Ohio State University right now. <laughs> he has been working on con conditional random field for many years. And today he will talk about his recent work in this area. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so uh, I, uh, when, I, when I was trying to figure out what to talk about in this um, talk, I thought, well, you know, my students are doing all this wacky stuff. And, I, and you know, how do I sort of summarize all this stuff? So, um, let me give you a quick overview of the lab. Um, basically, my, my viewpoint is, is that we want to be looking at linguistics to help us do speech, recogni you know, speech recognition and language processing. We want to be looking at language processing and speech recognition to help us do linguistics. I'm going to talk more about the former point um, than the latter point today. But that is sort of the overall thing um, that we're doing. And, um, Traditionally, we've been working a lot with, you know, in machine learning on the CSC side, and, and you know, a lot of people in linguistics to, to sort of uh, get some good insights. Recently, I've also been uh, dabbling in uh, stuff uh, with biomedical informatics and, and um, a partner over there at the Wexner Medical Center. So I'll talk a little bit about that today too, um, just to give you a, a broad overview of I. I was kind of surprised when I actually sat down and said, how many projects are we actually doing? And there's quite a few, um, both on the speech side and the language side. So we, we uh, up until recently, uh, had Chris Brew, um, who left for ETS. So I inherited a number of language projects. So it's, um, but um, uh, a lot of the stuff that we've been doing traditionally that, that people kind of know me for is the, working on speech recognition with CRFs and feature-based stuff. Um, uh, there's been some stuff with Karen Levescu uh, doing discriminative uh, FSTs and also some of the feature-based stuff. Um, we just recently got involved in um, a government project on multilingual keyword spotting. Um, and you can read all the rest of the stuff. We do a little bit of linguistics, so computational models of child language acquisition. So that's some work with Mary Beckman. Um, and uh, some stuff on the medical side of uh, looking at uh, timeline extractions. Uh, from electronic medical records and virtual patients. And there's also a little bit of stuff in kids' literature on how to predict the reading level. So there's a number of pro, uh, partners in all of these th things that I won't have time to go into detail. So today, I said, OK, we'll try and give you a slice across. To, so I'm going to try and balance my speech time and my language time, although I will tend to talk more about the speech, I think, because I'm very buoyant about it. But. Um, OK, so here's the overview. So today, I'm going to give you um, many of the people, you know, there's a lot of old familiar faces in the field, uh, in, in the room. So I'm, I'm going to give you a, um, for those who don't know what I do, give you sort of a how did we get here um, background on conditional random fields and stuff like that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we've been doing with segmental conditional random fields, um, articulatory feature modeling, and then I'll talk a little bit about the language stuff that we've been doing, where we've been taking CRFs and um, which kind of grew up in the natural language community and um, using them as event extractors to then do semi-supervised learning. Um, OK, so background or how we got into this mess. OK, so um, a lot of the things that I've been interested in are thinking about how do we break apart one of these problems into some sort of feature description and use combiners to um, do feature-based modeling. And that's sort of the, th the overall theme of the talk. Um, uh, and the idea is that, in general, we're going to be looking at ways to extract features from either speech or language and then combine using some sort of weighted model, usually a log linear weighted model. Um, and uh, just to give you a flavor of how I got into this whole mess, a uh, little bit of the old history. And um, I did my thesis way back when on pronunciation modeling. So I stole this uh, slide from. Rowett, who stole the slide from Karen um, uh, on pronunciation variation within switchboard. Okay, and that, that comes out of uh, work from Steve Greenberg and 
um, where they did transcriptions of, fine transcriptions of how people pronounce words in conversational speech. And you'll see that um, a lot of, there are a lot of different ways that people say, like for example, probably. And in fact, it's very unlikely, in fact, it was not observed that you actually see the full pronunciation of probably. But usually you say probably or probably or probably, you know, so there's a lot of variation. Um, and this is a real problem from the viewpoint of um, trying to build a good model of this is because we don't have complete linguistic evidence in the signal according to linguists, right? So the, these are linguists who are transcribing these utterances and saying, Here's, here are the things that I've observed, okay? So I did a thesis um, which nobody should ever look at on doing pronunciation variation. Um, uh, and people, you know, back in the 90s were getting, you know, modest success by basically saying, well, I'm going to take my pronunciation dictionary and I'm going to add these pronunciations. Well, I don't want to add too many of them because things are confusable and stuff like that. But we never really got too far from, with that approach because the more pronunciations you add to the system, the m uh, more likely it is that you're going to start confusing things. Okay. And... Um, so let's take a little bit of a little closer look at some of the data. And um, the, the thing that I'm going to show you is actually inspired by uh, some work that was done by Marat Sarklar and Sanjeev Kunipur at uh, Hopkins, which basically said, you know, what are the acoustic, the real acoustics that go along with the variations that we're observing? So um, I uh, have this following little uh, uh, example that if we just look at the Buckeye corpus of speech, now this is, again, conversational speech. But we get long-term speakers. Um, Switchboard has like five minutes of each um, conversation side. These are like hour-long transcriptions. So we get a lot of instances of, of, of uh, variation within a speaker. Um, and we can take a look at things like, let's just take a look at a versus e in the Buckeye corpus. Okay? And I'm going to look at just looking at the, uh, the formant structure of just saying, I'm looking at where are, the, where are their peaks in energy. Okay? Um, for a, uh, a, uh, and then when the dictionary said there should have been an a, uh, but, but the transcriber said that it was an a, uh, okay? So that would be like if I had bad and somebody transcribed it as bed, right? Which would be a confusable thing. But people do say this, okay? So here are the data that just correspond to as versus uh, that the, are, are transcribed as as, and these are as transcribed as as. So this is um, the first formant frequency versus the second formant frequency. And if you've ever done any linguistics, then you'll know that this sort of is one section of the vowel, tri uh, vowel triangle, OK? So um, the two forms distinguish themselves more in terms of duration than in terms of uh, not in that. Not in this corpus. The duration is actually roughly equivalent for, for this speaker. Yeah, yeah. So so not for this. Um, but I, I agree that that we're only look, I'm only looking at one dimension of of a very multi-dimensional thing. Right. Okay. So just to give you, I'm and the circles really mean nothing uh, as, as statistically. But just to give you a sense of like here's an here's a region where we see as and here's a region when we see as. Okay. So now here's your test. What happens when a is going to be transcribed as a? So, so the, the observer took, saw this particular thing and said, oh, OK, this a, this should have been an a, but it really was an a. So we, the transcriber decided to change the canonical pronunciation to a. Right? Well, well, where do you think that data should be? Should be, you would hope, in that overlapping region, right? Of course, it's not, because otherwise, why would I be showing this slide, right? So, so the actual data, which is marked with the blue stars, is all over the place. OK? And so some of it is in that region that you would expect. Some of those are in the A territory. Some of them are actually higher than A. OK, so the more over, this is almost into I, OK, in terms of where the formants are. And some of it actually sits, in fact, lower than a. And there's actually no phone that is actually lower than a, right? Um, you know, and again, this is this is a very hand wavy argument. But you can, but this kind of data was borne out more statistically with with um, the study that Marat and, and Sanjeev did. Okay, but here's the key: where is the data not? The data is not over here. 
okay? These are the back valves in here, okay? So what is the transcriber really trying to tell us? It's not that ah, it really was pronounced as an a. Eh. It was that it was a front vowel. It should have been an a. Eh. I don't know what it really should be. I don't know what the back, or I, I don't know what the vowel height should be. So I have some uncertainty as the height. I mean, that's sort of my loose interpretation of this. So we might have uncertainty in some dimensions in terms of the variation, but certainty in other dimensions. So if we start thinking about the linguistics in terms of, the, of a multidimensional variation of some sort of phonetic space, then we can start um, modeling some of these phenomena. Okay. So, um, right. So we can't take those transcriptions at face value. Okay. Um, so where where I've been looking um, uh, at at different kinds of representations is to think about subphonetic representations such as phonological features or articulatory features. Um, to, to represent these kinds of transcriptional differences. And the, the interesting question then becomes, how do you involve that into some sort of um, statistical model? So um, backing up a little bit to the statistical model side, um, I you know, grew up in, um, uh, at ICSI where neural nets were a big thing. So you know, one of our favorite things to do is to basically take some acoustics here, um, put a multilayer perceptron to try and predict, you know, which phone class is this given this little local chunk of speech. Okay, so I might have a local window of speech, and I'm going to get a posterior estimate that uh, for every frame, effectively out. Um, and if you are a um, uh, ICSI person, you might put this into uh, uh, do a diagonalization and, and uh, um, decorrelation and put it into an HMM. Um, but one of the things that we did is basically say, okay, we, we're going to build a log linear model on top of that, which is a conditional random field. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit more about the conditional random fields in a second. But essentially, what you're going to get out is instead of having these frame level posteriors, you end up getting these sequence level posteriors out. Okay. So why do I like this framework so much? Well, it's because we can start playing around with saying, hey, look, I have little local detectors of is this a manner? Is this a place? Is this a height? I can talk about these as features that I'm extracting from the data. And I can talk about combining features of different kinds of things. So, um, so this can be used in, in place of or in parallel to other types of things. So for example, Zilla did a lot of work in the, to begin with on um, uh, trying to extract things like uh, you know, using the sufficient statistics as the functions, right, and using a, a, a higher uh, hierarchical uh, or hidden conditional random field right, to, to try and do this kind of estimation. Also, at the same time. Yes. So we've done we've done that. You have to put x and and its squares straight, so you can get the sufficient statistics. It helps us a little bit, but it's it, it complicates the thing, the the the. It, it just it doesn't help enough to add that in all the time. But it's a good thing. So I'm probably just leading into the next slide. But please do. Um, how do you to sort of train those classifiers? You need a training signal, and you just showed us that the training signal was unreliable. Right. So ah, you're asking no, you're you're asking something that's not on the slides, but that's a very good question. Um, so what we're doing, so there's a different. Um, let me. There's two answers to that question, and in fact, they do come into the slides later on. Okay, so yes, you're right. You're you are anticipating. Um, so at, at a first guess, what we're going to do is basically take um, take a phone level alignment. In fact, usually from an HMM because we need we need that. That's one of the downsides to this is that you actually need. <coughs> to have, um, if you're not doing a hidden conditional random field, you need to have that, that label sequence, right? Um, and so uh, what we do is we take, the phone, we take a phone sequence, and then we can just back propagate it to what the appropriate features were, train independent nets. And what we're capturing essentially is, in some ways, the errors that each one of these makes in its estimation. And we might get a little bit of feature asynchrony or stuff like that. But but if you want to go to model more like the, the kind of articulatory feature model, you're going to need some other mechanism to try and handle that misalignment. And I'll, I'll, 
um, talk a little bit about Rowett's model, which you might have seen before, about uh, trying to do articulatory feature alignment. So hang on to that thought. OK. Uh, on that point, yeah. uh, my understanding is for CIF, well, with hidden uh, you know, CIF, you don't need to have precise alignment for the frame level to train CIF. To, to train, this, to train a, a straight up CRF, you need to have the frame level alignment. To train the hidden one, you don't. You don't. I see. Right, I see. because 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 the alignment is actually um, hidden uh, is is actually one of the um, one of the things that you need to. Uh, do. But you can do you you can do an embedded Viterbi type style training, which doesn't. I mean, with one realignment, basically you get back to where you need to be. So it's it's not a big deal to. Well, to when you put the CF. Yeah, you know, in the form that's model the whole sequence using the that's form right. by form. That by default you get hidden there already, but you don't really explicitly. I mean, rather than no, so three states. There. So the way that we're so the way that we're training it actually, you do have well, we've used both one state and three state type okay. models, but but yeah, you do you do actually have an explicit the way that we train it, we have this explicit um, labeling. Then we go and we 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 Viterbi relabel. And that, that gets us you know, to get away from the mismatch. Um, OK. Um, and this actually gets, that actually gets to an interesting point about the, the, the criteria. So let me, let me hold off on that idea for a minute. OK. So um, one of the very few equations that I've, I have on this, uh, in this talk is basically what we're interested in is a, a label posterior um, given the acoustics, and what we're going to do is talk about this in terms of a bunch of what we'll call state functions, which associate with each label essentially some feature function here, some generic feature function. I'm going to label those as my state functions. And also the transition functions, which talk about pairs of states in this case, because this, this is what we call linear chain CRF. And it may also have associations with the feature functions. And this actually turns out for us to be an important thing. It's an open question as to how important is it to have um, observational dependence on those transitions. We find that, that having the ability to talk about um, whether you're going from one state to another based on the transitions, which you can't do in an HMM straight up. Okay. This actually is important for us, that we get a, a, quite a, bit, a little bit of gain out of doing that. Okay. Um, OK, so um, just to sum up this little, this little sort of um, like this is like 2008 and before kind of thing. Um, you know, basically, you could play around with different versions of um, uh, the functions. So for example, if you're Yasser Hifni, you might say, here are my 20, you know, I've got 10,000 Gaussians, which are my 20 closest ones, right? And that would be a, a very sparse feature space, right? Um, so you, there's. There's a nice thing about this is you can talk about different kinds of features, plug them in together, and, and, and just train. Okay. Um, just to summarize the results that we got on previous studies with time at phone recognition, basically we found that um, we were beating the TANM HMM uh, systems using the posterior's input um, with many fewer parameters. Okay. Even just a monophone-based CRF was actually beating our triphone-based HMM. Now, Admittedly, this is not a discriminatively trained HMM, right? So the caveat there, right? And um, for timid phone recognition, training, training things discriminately is a, it's a mess. It's, it's just not enough data to really to get it done. Until the IBM, right. Yeah, yeah Brian's going to show me wrong, right, exactly. So um, uh, the transition features actually help us quite a bit. That was one of the other things we saw. And um, we played around with things where we combined a large number of phonological features and phone posteriors. Um, and then we found that that was a good, effective combination technique. OK. So any questions on sort of the background before I sort of segue into like what's new? OK. All right. Um, OK, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the upcoming interspeech paper that we have um, on uh, boundary factored CRFs. Um, so I'm glad Jeff's in the audience because <laughs> Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to sort of sing to his choir. You know, this whole, this whole talk in some ways is like bringing Coles to Newcastle because you, you guys do a lot of this kind of stuff uh, within the speech group. So um, I'm, you know, we're, we're adding little bits of knowledge, I think, to the kind of things that you guys are looking at. Um, 
So the frame level approach, um, while nice and easy to train, um, has a real problem. Is that, that the, what we're trying to do is maximize the conditional maximum likelihood of the frame labels, as opposed to upstream, what we really want is words in the end. Not even just phones. We want words, right? So there's this big criteria mismatch. And, um, and it gets down to exactly about this issue about segmentations and the fact that, you know, if I get, and, and the, the way to think about it is if I, if I had cat okay, and, I, and I got a whole bunch of Ks, um, let's see, cat is not good because A's are, should be long. So, so let's imagine I, in, I recognize cat is like K should have been one frame long and then there's a bunch of as and a bunch of tus, right? If I just label that one frame wrong, that's big. It's a big problem in terms of the recognition, right? But the criteria basically says, oh well, you just got one wrong out of out of this long sequence, right? So this is so the frame level criteria is kind of a really bad mismatch, okay? Um, as a side note to that, um, so one of the things that you want is sort of you know phonotactic grammars and stuff like that. Say this sound is likely to correspond to the next sound on a frame level. Those those probabilities or actually potentials in a CRF get really spread far apart because you've got all of the sequence of frames, right? So, so that's kind of bad from that point of view. And we want to be able to incorporate long span features like the duration, exactly to your point. Um, we, you know, duration is very distinctive, especially in a lot of languages that are not English. Um, formant trajectories, syllable phoneme counts, uh, all these kinds of things. So we want something else to, um, uh, to work on. So, uh, segmental CRFs to the rescue, da 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 da. Um, so um, the idea is I'm going to change my, my labels from Q to Y, where I'm talking Y is now a segment as opposed to Q is my frame. Okay? And we're going to talk about labels being on the segment label, but every label is going to correspond to some sort of chunk of frames. And um, probably Jeff has talked your ear off about it. But the idea is, is that we're, what you're going to do is you've got this implicit sort of um, uh, segmentation that's going on that basically says, hey, you know, this Y3 actually corresponds to two inputs, and I ne now need that segmentation is somewhat hidden from me. Okay, so but we're gonna. The nice thing is now, you know, phonotactic grammars now actually fit, right? So we're now talking about really this this phone is changed from that phone. Okay. So when you plug all this thing in, I'm gonna. Take all my state and function and, and transition functions and um, put them into sort of one one form here. Um, what I'm going to do is look at these segmentations, possible segmentations, and sum out over all the possible segmentations. And then now I can get a posterior on the sequence rather than the posterior on just the frames. Okay. So um, so that's uh, so that's that's essentially the model that's built into Scarf. Okay. And one of the questions. So one of the mantras in my lab is you know. What is the stupidest thing you can think of to do first? Um, and one of the questions we said was, well, what if you relax that assumption to basically say, hey, I'm going to actually just try and jointly predict the labels and the segmentations at the same time, um, which saves me on training time because I don't have to do all of this um, hypothesizing and summing over all, these th all of the possible segmentations. But on the other hand, it is exactly the same type of Viterbi assumption that I'm making in terms of the segmentation. And if my segmentation was wrong in the first place, then I'm going to have to correct it with a retraining. Right. OK. So, um, so this is the model that we're working with. But in, I think a lot of the lessons that we learn are really sort of transferable between the two. I don't think there's a big deal about this. This is mostly because it, it makes it com computationally tractable within the university setting, I think, is, yeah, um, for us. OK. Um, so. Yes. When you consider, when you're doing decoding, say, mm -hmm. don't you still have to consider all the possible segmentations? You, you do have to consider all the possible segmentations during decode time, right? So this is mostly to save on the, on the train time. That's right. Um, we also do put a limit on our segment length. Um, so that was another, that's another thing that we have done to sort of optimize the decode thing. So, and one of the things that we're, we're trying to do, and um, I was um, very annoyed to see Jeff coming out with a paper on this before, right before we did, but um, is to do one pass decoding um, uh, directly from the acoustics. Um, so that's why we were kind of interested in getting into this model. Um, so, 
So yeah, computation it will be square of the computation will be square of the duration. It's no, no, and so you have to. So, so you there's some computational tricks. Yeah. Okay. Limit. So you limit. So you limit. Uh, I'll I'll show you in a second. Uh, training does it fix? Don't you still have to do the work for Z? Um. You do have to do this. You do have to do the work for Z. Um. But oh, I okay. Right, so this is the problem with presenting your students' work, right? It's, <laughs> it's like the reason why you went into this is not the reason that ended up happening. Um, uh, the, so, so you do need to do it for the Z, you're right. And um, the, so we did these computational tricks on the segment length to basically um, make it more manageable. So basically, we experimented with, um, uh, going off slide a little bit, we experimented with the idea, actually, let me come back to that, but, but because I'll have a slide that I can point to in a second. So um, actually, I'll just go up here. So um, on the efficient segmental CRF slide, the, the upshot is, is that we found that um, if you we played around with actually in a classification task, what would be the optimal size of segments? Like if I if I had a long segment longer than whatever my optimal whatever my maximal size was D, I'm going to call that D, right? Um, then I would go and uh, segment a, a phone into two two boundaries, right? So I might have the first half of a phone and the second half of a phone, or maybe you know multiple chunks of D length. And the question that we had was, how bad does that hurt? And we found out that after doing some experimentation on, um, for, for the Timit task at least, um, that having a, an a optimal size of about 10 was a good trade-off between decoding speed and accuracy. We didn't really lose so much accuracy by saying my maximum length of a duration was 10, and if I had something as longer than 10, then I'm just going to postulate two segments. OK, in the end. All right. Um, so I, the. One of, the, one of the ways that I've been thinking about this problem is that um, what you're really talking about is a, is a different kind of CRF when you're talking about a segmental CRF in, in some ways. What you're really talking about is a model where the time now becomes sort of a first class variable, right? So the segmentation var variables are also going to be um, uh, are, are the segmentation times of my segments right, are actually also variables that I want to hypothesize. Okay? So um, when I have a graph like this, a CRF basically defines its probability structure over the cliques in the graph. Okay? So I have some natural cliques here because I can talk about this phone is between this time point and this time point. Okay? I can also talk about, so I can talk about extracting evidence from that, from the acoustics. I can talk about a prior to say this phone is likely to be this long, right, on this, on this thing. But I also have these inverted triangles, which basically say, hey, here is a, uh, a phone and its, and its successor, and I believe the boundary is at this point, right? And I can talk about acoustic observations that correspond to the transition between phones. So there's a lot of there were uh, in um, there were a lot of uh, models that that at some points tried to like the there was a model called the spam model out of ICSI that tried to focus on transitional areas in speech rather than than segmental areas. And this is a this is a natural way to to think about incorporating that type of evidence. Of, of a different nature, OK? Has this mechanism given you the ability to model form and transition? You mentioned earlier about the problem. Yeah, uh, well, the form and transition, that, that's an interesting question. Um, so, so the steady state within, so the natural, like if you, if, let's imagine if Y were a triphone, right? Then you would expect that a formant transition type structure might be important here. But if you were looking at like local area of formant transitions from ba to a, ah, for example, right, this might be an area where you could actually um, incorporate features like that, right? So it gives you that flexibility to start thinking about the linguistics of the situation, 
right? And and plug in. I got this great uh, transition detector that will do you know X, right? And I can plug it in as oh, this is something that focuses on boundaries versus steady state. Okay. Um, now the problem. Um, and, and I said before we were very interested in all these transitional, like the, that having dependence, acoustic dependence on the transitions between phones. Um, if you try and do this directly within um, the uh, segmental CRF, you incur essentially an n squared d and times the length of the, that's the, 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 the I, this is the code complexity. Um, and the question is, because you need to, um, keep track of essentially the durations of either one of these uh, and also the pair of these things, right? So there's all of the, po you have to look at all possible segments. Um, uh, and I, um, uh, so, so what Ryan discovered is, hey, let's do the following. We're gonna, we're gonna model a boundary itself as a intermediate node this is deterministic, right? This essentially is going to carry something about, the, about its segmentation, but this doesn't carry any information about the segmentation. So you give up the ability to talk about the value, the, the duration of both segments in joint. Okay, so you do give up something with this model, but if you don't have features that talk about that, then you can basically say, look, I'm interested in knowing the time point that this ends, right? It's transitioning to this, this point, and maybe I might look over a local window of these features. Okay, so we're changing the problem so that you're not able, you're no longer able to look over the entire span of the segment, but you're allowed to look at a local window around a boundary, and that's really what we want to focus on. Okay, so Ryan called this uh, boundary-factored segmental condition random field. Okay. Exactly what the b in a the value does. So this is a deterministic value. This basically carries, like, this might be an ad that goes for five frames. Or, well, and this one is an ad that goes for three frames, right? This just says you're going into an ad. Oh, I see. Right? So that makes this, um, well, it's not deterministic because essentially it carries a prior on, you know, the duration of, a, of, of segments, right? A, the, um, but, uh, but it does, but, and the time point is actually carried by the, the previous time, right? So this, 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 one way to think about it is this has a, um, uh, it carries a label and a time point as opposed to a label and a duration, okay? Right. So, um, so it turns out that with that clever trick, you actually can get quite a bit of speed up in doing this. Okay, so we did some, um, yeah. For the second one, why do you still call it a segmental CRF? It's not segmental. It is. It is segmental because we still have we still have these segments, <coughs> right? The, the the labels are still on the segmental level. Right, but you said that you're not using any of the features about the segment. I, it, in the transition, in the transition boundary, the segments still now respect. Yeah, as transition feature, you're only looking at the like the local. That's location. right. So so. But, and these are transitions between segments, right? So this segment actually gets to observe everything about its segment information. Um, not exactly. That's sure, his. sure. This gets, to, this gets to observe all of the data that is within its box. That is a segmental thing. It is not a single frame. Yeah, but, but you still have to know the boundaries before you can extract the features from this. That's right. So you have to hypothesize the segmentation. So, so, how, right. so I don't understand why you say the computation now over here. Um, because 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 we don't have to we no longer have to model the joint pair of all at, all of phone one with duration d one times all of phone two with duration d two. We 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 compile it down into a single time point, so that so that you're only allowed to talk about the transition feature is allowed to only look at local boundaries, but the, seg but the segmental feature, the, the, the state feature, is allowed to look at all the segmental information okay, within its segment. Okay? Okay. So, and I wanted to point out that, that most of the models that are out there don't even use any information on the observational side for the, for the segments. Right? They're just mostly priors on this. Right? So it's, it's particularly this question of how do you get the, the observational dependence into the transitions in the, in the right way, right? Is 
about the computational capacity in terms of decoding, right? Yes. yes decoding. Yeah. Yeah, but decoding is still otherwise you don't you don't get a feature, right? If I mean because the feature extraction is based on the segment. So the segment, how so we do it. So so here's how we. Okay, you're you're anticipating me. Good, 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 good. Okay, so let's let's do a head-to-head -head comparison between a frame-level CRF and a segmental CRF. Okay, that that's that was the key thing because we realized that nobody's really kind of done that. And so let's let's see what happens. We're going to use the same exact feature input. So I'm going to use my posteriors coming off of all of my either my phones or my phones and phonological features. Okay, and. Um, and I'll train up my usual Jeremy Morris style uh, CRF, frame level CRF. Okay. Now the question is how do we go to extracting segmental level features? So remember you have to hypothe you hypothesize the segmentation and then you do the feature extraction. So what we're doing is basically saying, okay, the state features we're going to sample uniformly for my posterior space. So if I have something, so I might take five snapshots, and if it's a 10 long, I'll make them evenly spaced. If they're three long, I might oversample. Okay, but in, in, what I end up with is a, a fixed feature vector. Okay, that, that basically describes, you know, different points within that within that segment. Okay, and we played around with different things like, you know, what's the maximum of this value? What's the, you know, the, you know. Uh, Maximum within the window, you know, all the all these kinds of things. We 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 played with a number of things. This seems to work well, you know. But you could imagine plugging in something else. There, there's nothing that says that you can't, you know. What you need is an online feature extractor that basically says, "I'm hypothesizing this segment at this time. Give me the features that correspond to this, right?" So ours basically our our version of that basically just says, "I'm going to uniformly sample within my posterior space." Of in time, I, I should say. Okay, and we throw in the duration feature as well. Okay, and for the experiments, I'm going to show the maximum duration was 10. Okay, for the transition features, we played around with two different kinds of things. One is that basically this frame level transition feature basically just says, give me the posteriors that surround the boundary frames within some window, and I also might incorporate a direct MLP prediction of is this a boundary or not. Okay, so you can you can train a, a, an MLP that does that as well. Now the segment level basically basically says I have to look at I I have to look at the hypothesized segmentation on either side, and and now extract the features corresponding to both sides. So if I want the segments, I now have to both hypothesize the segmentation on the left and a segmentation on the right. Okay, so this is more expensive. Okay, and this is what we're trying to get away from. Okay, but, but we want to know how much do we lose by actually going to this local boundary idea. Okay, so this is core test accuracy. We also tend to report on enhanced accuracy, which um, tends to be about, which is like the full, the full dev set, and that tends to be about two points higher. So if you're ever wondering why these numbers look a little lower than Jeremy's, because he tends to report on the enhanced stuff. Um, so the core test. Um, Basically, um, if you plug the stuff into a tandem HMM, you get about roughly the same thing as this frame CRF. On the enhanced set, it turns, tends to be bigger um, and, and statistically significant. Um, so when we just use segmental state features with no, bound, no transitional information, we get essentially a boost. And that, so this is really um, compared to that. Okay, so you get about two points by going directly from frame to, to segments. Okay. Um, when you incorporate, um, uh, now if you do the full SCRF training, um, where you have to look at all pairs of possible things, you get a training time of about 62 minutes. When you now collapse it down by having this fan in to a single state, um, you actually improve training time quite a bit. This is per epoch of, of training. Um, so when we put in the segmental transi transition feature, we get another point here. And that's, so that's nice, right? Um, so it turns out that if you, if you instead do some sort of windowed computation, you can actually get a little bit more. Um, and you'll notice that this becomes really expensive to train in the CRF world, right? Uh, it's not so bad. It's, you know, about eight times faster or so, right, that to, to do this sort of just focus on the boundary rather than looking at all the all pairs, okay? So you can you can do this trade-off of like is it worth the extra point to to do 
you know, essentially three times as much training. You can, you can play with this idea, right? There's some happy medium. We're just showing you some choice points. Now, this was using just the phone posteriors. Um, yeah? Are the numbers in the last two rows there, there's two different training times. Yes. Right. Yes, that's right. For the boundary SCRF and the regular SCRF. Right, exactly. Are the accuracies the same? The accuracies turn out to be exactly the same. Oh. Because the models are exactly the same. Because we're not using any features that talk about. Oh, in the SCRF, it's not using. It's not using anything. Power. That's right. It's not, it doesn't have a feature that talks about that, so it's just wasted power. Exactly right. Yes. So they're, they're, they're equivalent. Because of the types of features you want to use. Yeah, yeah. So one of the advantages of using segmental features is that you can, for example, take an average of the you know, MSCC across the window. That's right. You will miss. No, 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 no. We can do that. We, we do that. We did that as one of our experiments. Oh, as okay. you just because instead of taking the average of MSCCs, you take the average of the posteriors. Yeah. Right. And then we so we've done that, and that, that works about the same as taking the the uniform sampling or uh, all the stuff. You know. So I mean, each one works a little better or a little worse in various situations. Right. Um, okay, uh, so that's if you add in the phonological features. It turns out, uh, annoyingly, that um, we actually ended up with the same amount by adding the phonological features, so it helps down here. So we're still sort of puzzling over that a little bit. Um, I don't know what to say about that yet. Okay, that, um, so we're, we're, we're eventually moving to um, word recognition on, on this. Um, uh, and the idea is that we can, uh, one option to, uh, that we're, we're interested in doing is basically saying, look, you know, we can use Jeff's SCARF system as a higher level processing to basically take this, this becomes a first pass that the SCARF can now incorporate um, larger uh, segmental features on. And so we basically put out lattices and then, and then have SCARF sort of work on that. Um, so that's one option that we're looking at for doing word level decoding. Um, the other option that we're looking at is Jeremy Morris did some sort of hybrid uh, recognition style uh, thing for basically turning this into like a hybrid neural network, except for that it works on sequences rather than individual uh, uh, phones. So, um, so that's all I had to say on this topic. And I see that I'm running really long. So um, I, um, I guess I'm going to give you guys a choice. Because, because I will have to sort of shrink. So I have some, um, I, I know Rohit actually gave a talk here on the articulatory feature stuff last year when he was um, interning. So I could turn to the, the more text-based processing stuff, or I could talk a little bit, a little a dabble on each. So maybe I'll have a show of hands. the room until noon. Oh, do we have, do we have time? I don't. We, till we, till we, till we have 11.40? We have Dan showing up. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. We have, yeah, I, I was. Leave at eleven thirty. Pick him up. Okay. If there's a group of us, so that's going to lunch, we should probably beat the lunch crowd. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So, Eric, so just so you can help calibrate, there's probably uh, five or six people in this room who might have seen Robit stock. Okay. So that's that's a good calibration. So maybe I should. Uh, I don't. Know. So would people would people prefer to hear more about like artic uh, so. Articulatory feature modeling that sort of answers Lee's question a little bit about the stuff, uh, or text-based processing. And I'll touch on each one just to give you the flavor of what's going on. Okay. So, but uh, okay, I'll, I'll 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 zip through a little bit. Okay, articulatory feature modeling. Okay, so um, what are we what we've been doing up to this point is basically taking articulatory features and then sort of. Um, um, using them as estimates and then combining them um, by thinking about a linear sequence of phones. Okay, and one of the things that we're interested in, I've been working with Karen Levescu, um, uh and with two of my students, Rowett, who you guys know because he interned here last year, and um, Priti uh, Dioti, um, and uh, we've been working on some articulatory feature modeling, and we've been sort of complexifying the CRFs in a different dimension, which is um, in terms of factored state spaces rather than factoring time. So um, just to give you a, a, a view of this, um, what, you know, one way of thinking about the world is of, 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 uh, of language is that, so if you have the word sense, it can often be pronounced as sense, 
because there's if you get the articulators out of synchrony, right, you end up uh, having more of a closure and then a release, which ends up sounding like a T. So it so you get sense instead of sen sense. It's hard to do on on the fly. Okay, so there are models of this like articulatory phonology. And Karen has spent a lot of time um, thinking about models, and, and this built on some stuff that Lee had done as well, and thinking about, can we build models of how articulators combine to produce phonological effects? OK. So the idea here is that if you get an asynchrony in the tongue body, the tongue tip, and the lips moving at a different time than the velum and the glottis does, you end up with um, I should say it's over here, this, the, the asynchrony. Well, I guess both are asynchronous. But um, you end up with a nasalized vowel, and you also end up with um, this extra phone that didn't appear in the original transcription. And the claim is that this can account for a lot of that pronunciation variation we saw in the beginning. Um, it can and it can't. It, is, it, there, it counts for some of the effects. It doesn't count for all of them. OK. Um, and so Rowett. Um, built this model that he talked about last year um, where we're trying to do articulatory feature alignment. And this gets back to the question I was asked about, how do I get the targets for the, all of the MLPs that I'm training, right? And the problem is, is that if you're going from a phone, if you're going from this, right, if I just project from this phone to each one of these dimensions, so that I've changed my change my categorization here because I'm using articulatory features rather than phonological features, but the point is the same. I don't, I'm not going to be able to really match what's really going on, which is this, right? So a mapping here from you know, N in, in this nasalized N, right, um, isn't going to be able to get me f this particular asynchrony very well. OK, unless I have a really fine transcription. In fact, so we can use the switchboard transcription project as our fine transcription and then project backwards. So that's, that's the way that we're going to seed our models to answer some questions. But if, I, if I'm just going off of a dictionary where I don't have detailed hand transcriptions, I'm not going to be able to get this. So the question is, how do I bootstrap from models where I've got this really fine transcription and be able to project back to this kind of space? And that's where the alignment comes in. So I basically want to say, hey, I've got the word sense coming in, and I want to be able to um, say I expect sort of some asynchronous thing going on with it. The, there's some synchrony going on between the streams, but not, there's some asynchrony going on between the streams. So I need to have a model of that. Okay? So we put up this monstrosity. Right? Ugh! Right. But let me, let me make that a little simpler. Okay. So, we, so let's think of each one of these colors as some sort of um, asynchronous state where basically you're now thinking about um, what is the value of, so I have essentially a phone um, that map, so between this word and the subword state, it will map to a, a particular articulatory feature which is corresponds to a phone, okay? Now, um, there's a model that basically says, are these features allowed to be asynchronous? What is the probability distribution over being them asynchronous? And I can talk about um, uh, different streams going on in parallel, one, two, three, and as many as I want, right? Where they each have these, these linear structures going over time, um, but also have synchrony constraints that go on between the streams, okay? So this is kind of a, a uh, really ugly factor graph. The red, by the way, the red things are trainable. The blue things are actually um, uh, deterministic. So, so not, it's not as bad like, as having to learn everything about, about these things, right? So, um, but we can take advantage of these deterministic constraints because the number of red constraints is actually pretty small, right? And we can boil down this model into essentially a very simple model that talks about a vector space of subword configurations. Okay, and we can talk about the fact that, so let's imagine I put a limit, so if I had cat and I had three streams, I could have 111, 222, 333, or I could have 111 and then 121 and then 222, 333. So I can start getting things that are asynchronous out of, out of line, right? If I put a limit on that on how far 
my articulator is allowed to get out of synchrony. And, and the, the, the ones and twos and three basically talk about the canonical positions for the k, the a, and the t, right? Or for the sense, right? For s, a, n, and s, right? So I can talk about, oh, well, this one moved ahead, but this one didn't, right? And all that really is is a change in index space, OK? So if you do that, basically, net, we now have basically a bunch of trainable parameters and then one, one basic configuration parameter that basically says, hey, this is a, uh, uh, these are the possible transitions between these two states. So we actually, I, do we keep that fixed? In that? Uh, it doesn't matter. OK. But the idea is that what we're doing is eliminating deterministic variables. And that basically, so we originally tried to implement this with a general purpose CRF toolkit, and it got hairy. Um, uh, by doing some neat tricks, which actually are related to the tricks for the boundary related factor thing about, about restricting your state spaces, you can actually get a, a computationally tractable model. Um, and we found that if you take the alignment error rate, um, we actually end up getting articulator uh, alignment errors reduced by about 5 to 15% relative. Okay. Um, so that's sort of where, where that's been. So you initialize the model by using switchboard transcription project. Oh, I see. Okay, so you have hand transcribed things, and then we're going to propagate. Well, we're actually, in that case, we're training and testing on that set. But the idea is eventually we're we're going. We are we then took that and aligned all of switchboard for another experiment. But I'm not going to talk about that. But yes, so you use that as a bootstrap. But you don't have a timid result for this. Uh, we don't have a timid result for this model. No, that's right. Um, we we probably should do a timid result for this model. Right, that's a good point. Okay, and if you're interested in more details, that that was our ASRE 2011 paper. Okay, um, so uh, Rowett's got to graduate at some point so that he can go off and be a great researcher somewhere. So you know, and that that he was playing around with trying to get this to be full recognition, um, and he said, well, you know, what if I tried to do this as keyword spotting? We we en uh, enlisted the help of Yossi Keshet, um, who was uh, who had done some discriminative keyword spotting and um, built a model that basically says, hey, I'm going to develop this feature-based keyword spotter that basically says, all right, I've got two segments of speech. And um, one has the word, one does not have the word. And the objective function that I want to optimize basically says, my score for the thing that has the word had better be better than the score that doesn't have the word. OK, that's the very simple version of that. So that's, we, want, we want this function. And I'm not going to talk too much about that, but the idea that's behind this is that this now becomes, this we can parameterize with some lambda weighted sets of features that we extract from something. Okay? Um, and in this case, we're going to use the alignment model to basically say, what's my best alignment okay, of the word? And then we're going to extract features from those segments found in the alignment. Okay? And um, currently, he's done this with phone-based alignments, but, they, but what he's working on now is to try and get articulator-based alignments. Okay, um, and uh, at the moment, so we just finished a paper off for MS, MLSLP, which is the machine learning and signal language, uh, speech, machine and uh, machine learning and speech and language processing um, uh, uh, new thing that that's the, the symposium that's coming up, um, and it turns out that's actually worked pretty well. Um, uh, in low resource settings where you don't have a lot of data, which is important to us if we, uh, let's say, have uh, uh, a language from a new data, uh, data from a new language where we don't have a lot of data. So we haven't conducted any experiments on that kind of multilingual setting. But um, so uh, I realized that was an extremely hand wavy sort of uh, uh, version of this, but it, I do want to talk a little bit about the stuff we've been doing with. Electronic medical records. So, if anybody had any questions about that, but that's just to give you the flavor of we get articulators alignments, and then we're going to use those um, to extract features for doing one of these keyword spotters. Okay, that's the that's the real rub. Yeah, so, you said you have two paths for UCF to do that. Yeah. Uh, so the this, so this turns out to be uh, the the model turns out not to be a CRF in that case. It turns out to be a perceptron. It's kind of like a perceptron. Yossi wouldn't call it a perceptron. I call it a perceptron, but it, you know, right. Uh, it's trained, it's actually trained using a um, max margin 
style approach. So I guess you could think of it as an SVM, a linear SVM. Um, OK. Um, last bit, um, I, I've been working on some um, uh, electronic medical record stuff, which has kind of um, uh, uh, been a, a kind of eye-opening. And it's kind of taking, taking me back to the CRF stuff you know, where, where did CRF stuff come from in terms of language processing? So uh, uh, as, as Zillow was saying, um, I, I've been dragged back into language. <laughs> it's like, whoa. Um, OK, so let me give you a, a, a medical record. This is a sanitized medical record out of, um, out of uh, uh, OSU Medical Center. Um, and um, you'll notice some interesting things about this. So you've got uh, some information uh, corresponding to the um, the patient and the doctor and all the, this is all structured data, right? Um, and then we've got a bunch of unstructured data that's, that's in particular uh, regions. So what's the, what's the history? You know, what did we find in terms of tests? What are we planning to do? Okay. And the idea is that we're going to get multiple of these nodes. And eventually, over the, what we want to be building over lifetime is a model where we say, here's our first narrative. We have some things where, you know, here's our admission date. There are some things that happened before admission. There's some things that happen after, after admission but before discharge. And there's some things that happen after discharge or plan to happen after discharge, right? And here's, oh, it's second admission, which is hopefully after the first discharge date, hopefully way after, but not often um, in, in some of these things. And um, so if there's a readmission, you know, we now know that the medical history is going to correspond to some events, but maybe in some other events that weren't in this original thing. And how do we find all these correspondences? Okay, so this becomes this interesting problem of how do I know when a medical event in one document or within one document it corresponds to another medical event within that document or across documents? So there's sort of two problems: within document and cross document co-reference resolution of medical events. So it's kind of like NR4 resolution in Language processing, but we're here. We're talking about events, event resolution. Okay. So the obvious thing to do. Oh, and I just want to point out. You know, so here we've got cocaine use. You know, is uh, these are labeled twice in the same data, and this is the same. Um, but you might have chest pain here, but this chest pain actually is not the same as that chest pain. Okay. Uh, we'll see an example of what that really means. So, um, and. The thing is, is that labeling these things is hard. And the, the, you can get reasonable inter, 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 entertainer agreement if you spend a lot of time at it, but it takes forever. To, we've got, at this point, uh, at the point of this study, we had three patients and about 35 clinical notes. I mean, it really takes, and that was with four annotators going through and, and doing all this stuff. So it's pretty. Um, pretty ugly. So we want to use some sort of semi-supervised techniques, right? Um, and the question is, can we use unlabeled data to do that, right? Um, so what we want to do is build the temporal classifier um, to do this because uh, when people think about co-reference resolution, they often think about semantic concepts, which is, is chest pain, acute chest pain, are they the same thing, right? So there's some semantic overlap, right? But it turns out there's a lot of cues that correspond to temporal information according to events um, that, that really can tell you, is this the same event or not? Um, I'm going to skip the semantic. Uh, so I'm going to we, we take it for granted. We extract a bunch of semantic features that are medically relevant. OK. Um, but I want to talk about the, the temporal stuff, because that's, that's actually where our, our newest work. People have done that kind of thing for, um, for the semantic stuff. So the idea is, is that what we're going to do is try and build course time bins and build a sequence tagger, conditional random field, to basically try and assign medical events to relative th point times point times bah, points in time relative to admission. Okay, um, so we might, we may have things that are way before admission, just before admission, like way before admission, like a year. Okay, before admission, after admission, or after discharge. OK, those are a big, or add admission is the other one, right? And the idea is, OK, so here's our medical note, right? So you've got cocaine use and hypertension. It's with a history of, right? So that is way before, right? Chest pain, which started two days ago, is also before admission. He does not have chest pain now. That's after admission. But 
uh, ever since the episode two days ago before admission. So here we have chest pain. These two are not co-referent, but this episode is co-referent with, with uh, um, um, chest pain. Okay. So we're going to need some semantic information to know that chest pain could be an episode, right? So that's what the semantic stuff is doing. And the temporal stuff is basically giving us a different view. So, we, so we're going to extract state functions, and then we're going to have uh, some transition functions, in the usual zero thing. Okay, so what are the what are the kinds of functions that you would actually extract? One is um, what what section are you currently in? Okay, it's not a guaranteed thing. So past medical history doesn't necessarily always. I mean, it's, it's going to be a bias definitely to things that are before admission, but things doctors don't always pay attention to what they're typing where, right? So things that can happen after admission still occur in that. That's right, right. So we we look at the section, but it's a good clue, right? Um, we're also interested in lex lexical features, so history of presented with, right? These are going to be the preceding bigrams, right, that, that uh, will tell us something. Um, um, we also extract things like um, it, not only just the preceding bigrams, but we also, you know, parts of speech and stuff like that so that we, so that we know that, oh, this is probably a temporal model, modifier, right? So that's a good thing to know. Okay. Um, the other thing is, is that the, there's actually a lot of time, re relative time references in here. So two days ago, two days ago, well, these two things are going to map um, to this. So we look for the closest uh, relevant, you know, uh, bits of, uh, of temporal expressions. So we do a temporal expression parser, for example. And essentially what we end up doing is building this model using all, uh, all of these expressions, and we can now label every event with... We, we know the admission date because that's in the structured data. And now we basically say um, we can give a relative time, essentially, based on where we're assigning things in the temporal bit. Okay. Why is this important to us? Well, essentially, we're going to then take our semantic features as one view of the world. Temporal features are another view of the world. And we're going to do semi-supervised learning in a multi-view type of environment. And we played with two different multi-view strategies. One is to basically do co-training, where you basically say, I'm going to train classifier on one type of feature, predict um, label instances in my unlabeled data that I'm pretty sure about, and then use that to train the other, and then go back and forth, and go back and forth, and go back and forth. And that. How do you represent the feature? Is it it's, it's just a huge sparse vector. OK. So okay in the, one, yes. And that was easier. Right. Um, and uh, the other option is to basically talk about posterior regularization. Um, I'm not an expert in posterior regularization, so I'm going to wave my hands by basically saying, look, the, you can develop a probability structure and then have a prior from some other model. Well, the other model, the temporal model, now serves as a prior for this, the, the semantic model, and the semantic model is a prior for the temporal model. And then you can, again, do that kind of labeling so that you try and um, constrain the amount that you that you disagree on those on the outputs of those two things. So you go back and forth and back and forth. Um, so just to give you a sense of this, um, if you do supervised learning on a 60-40 split of the data, um, this is a data set that we, for which we have all the data. You get about 77% on clinical notes with recall of precision of 77% of is this co-referent recall of 90%. Um, Co-training basically uh, works a little worse than posterior regularization for this, but essentially we're getting pretty close to the supervised learning, which is was surprising uh, to us. And we have not actually taken advantage of all of the vast numbers of clinical nodes that we could do. So that's the, to be the future experiment. OK, so summing. Sorry to blast through the last bit. but. Um, I just wanted to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that we're working on in the speech, in, in the speech and language technology lab. We've got a, a, a number of other projects, as I said. Um, but um, a lot of the stuff that we're doing is basically on, you know, how do I think about intelligent feature extraction and, and then plugging it into relatively standard uh, segmental tools. So we've been doing this in speech processing and, you know, how do you do intelligent factorization of that space and the text processing, we've been using those as features for something else, right? Um, so um, 
Um, and one of the things that uh, we've noticed is that you basically, if you start using things like, um, you know, people talked about CRFs as a replacement for HMMs, the kind of discriminative HMMs. They're, they're a little more powerful than, I mean, even a linear chain CRF is more powerful than a HMM when you start thinking about transition observations. I think that the practical import of it is that, I mean, it, the, the High Gold paper kind of shows that you can factorize the space back into that um, in practical terms, this is an easy way to, to, to have this observational dependence, right? Um, and so we've been using the sequence models also as features for other learners and, and finding out that that, you know, incorporating sequence information at the lower levels can often help when you're doing the prediction for other tasks as well. So those are the, the two main messages. So that's all I have to say. You mentioned former transition early on. I'm sorry, say. You mentioned former transition yes. early on. Do you have any thought on how to incorporate that? In no, but I would love it if you. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, I, I've, been, I've, been, I've been wrapping my brain around that yeah. for a while. And I, I have some ideas on like curve modeling and stuff like that. but. Mm, I don't, I don't, it's not, I don't have anything solid, so. Do, do you have an idea of how you can better incorporate many models in the CRF systems? Oh, I'm depending on Jeff to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, um, that's an interesting question, because the, because the state space, um, uh, I mean, I think, I think the way that Jeff does it is not, is not a, a bad start because it, because he thinks about uh, it's hard to talk about this with him in the room, uh, <laughs> but but uh, you know th thinking about the the language model state space um, you know allows you to think about any any depth of language model that you want because you're just thinking about this as state space and but um, I think if you I think, you know, my, my take on it is you're probably going to, if you're not going to be able to get an all one system, I think you're going to, and, and we don't, we get this with the, the deep nets and we get all this stuff is that I, I kind of see this as the acoustic smoothing over, over a number of lower level estimates that can give you some sort of phonological substrate and then you use that to, to, to go upwards from there. So I think the language model stuff, you know, you would do, you could do some interesting things either with Max or CRF style models on top of a lattice, in kind of the way that Jeff Jeff thinks about this model. I think it's, it's and so as long as you can, so I, that would be my answer. But I, I don't have a good answer for you. I think is the upshot. Yeah. All right.